So let's talk about women ministry. Let's talk about women in the ministry. In the Bible says in the last days I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It says all male flesh, doesn't it? No. Are you sure? No. Ask John MacArthur. I think he's a bit confused. <laughs> all flesh. All flesh means women, men, even children. Yes. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and they shall prophesy. And they shall dream dreams and they shall have visions. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Am I right? Yes. So that means that women can also get the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And why would he be poured out upon you? It's so that you can do ministry so that other people can be saved and changed and delivered. Otherwise, what's the point? So that you go, Ooh. that's not the point. The point is to equip you to do ministry. Then the real scripture that comes in, and this is where you're going to have to take notes, is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. You all know what it is, but I'm going to relate it to women now. 11, it says this, 4. How oh, I love this scripture. And he gave some apostles. Do you know that there are women apostles in the Bible? Amen. No, you don't know that. I mean, you're all very excited about that. What is an apostle? Apostle is someone who starts something new. Right. That's all he is. Yeah. He goes and does something nobody else would do. Yeah. Paul was the perfect apostle. He'd go into these strange countries, preach the gospel, get people saved, get start churches. So why can't women do that? Of course they can. There's a lady in the scripture, Paul at greets her, her name is Junia. Now, if you go into the history of the name Junia, you will notice that it divided the church in the 11th century. Because half the church fathers said it was a man, and the other half said it was a woman. I tend to go for the women's side of the church fathers. I think they had more brains than the other bunch. Because I think the other bunch spoke out of their prejudice. I think the other fathers spoke out of the spirit. You see, God doesn't care if you're man or female. God cares if you're a spirit that's born again and sanctified in Him. He can use you as an apostle. You can start a new work, sister. You can start a church if you want. You can start five churches like I have if you want to. There's nothing stopping you in the Scripture. Then he goes on and he says, okay, we've got apostles. And some prophets. Well, 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 well. Isn't that interesting? They say, oh, there are no prophets today. Well, I, you know what I beg to differ with you, man? Oh, there are prophets all over the place. In fact, they're popping up like dolls. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there's a new prophet. That's true. I'm not saying they're all straight and they're all, they're all honest, but I'm saying they're popping up all over. Yeah. And here's the truth. When Jesus came into the temple, the prophetess Anna came and saw Jesus as a baby. And when, and when the man went and he prophesied over Jesus. She was right there watching this whole thing. Philip had four daughters that would prophesy. I was in a church just when I first came here, one of the Latino churches, and the Lord told me, call out four prophetesses. I go, there's about 80 people here. How will I know if there are four prophetesses? So I said to the lady who was running the meeting, I said, give me your prophetesses. I didn't give her a number. Who came and sat next to me? Four of them. Chum, chum, chum. I said, we're in the spirit tonight. <laughs> now, why can't God raise up prophetesses? He has no prejudice like some of the Baptist pastor men have. I can't stand men who say, oh, women must go home, be barefoot, fat, pregnant, over the stove, cooking food, ironing my clothes while I go preach. Oh, I want to tell you something. Have you ever heard of Woodward Etta? Oh, yes. 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 We, we as Pentecostals wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. Because she was the first Pentecostal woman preacher that preached in America and brought revival. Didn't come through a man. In one of her books she says, God offered this to a man, but he didn't want it. Hey, how about Catherine Kuhlman? She made a major change in the churches when she was around. 
She brought the emphasis on the Holy Ghost that somehow got lost through the eons of time. Man, I want to tell you, there are many ministers, men ministers in the ministry because of Catherine Coleman. Just ask Benny Hinn. So what's the deal about the woman? How about Amy McPherson, Simpleton McPherson, what is it? She changed the whole of Hollywood when she was there. All the producers were coming to her and asking for ideas for movies. Apart from receiving Jesus. So now why can't some of you here be prophetesses? Why is it always left to the men? And I'll tell you what's happening with the men. <laughs> I'm a South African. If I offend you, remember one thing. You can hang me on Tuesday. But I'm leaving on Monday. <laughs> Where are the men? They're missing. Oh, I prayed for President Trump, but oh, I'm so sorry I prayed for President Trump. Oh, please forgive me for praying for President Trump. You think I'm joking. That pastor up north, he apologized for praying for the president of your country. What's he, a coward? Judas? Where's he come from? He shouldn't be in the ministry. Should be selling insurance rather. <laughs> I can't stand men that are cowards. You stand up for Jesus or go away, disappear. Get out of the limelight. Stand up for the Lord. If Jesus was prepared to give his body and his blood for us, my goodness, at least we can tell the truth and we can stick to the word of God, which says pray for those who are in authority over you. And the President Trump is that man. Whether you like Trump or not, bad luck. Pray for him, because the Bible tells you to do that. If what had happened to Trump was happening in Africa, all those people who come with all their shifty stuff would all be put up against a wall and shot or hung. You guys have lost the understanding of what treason is. You don't know what treason is. In Africa, they still know what treason is. And if they can't get you with a bullet or a hanging, they, you have a motor car accident. But you don't speak against the president of the country, even though you don't like him. Because he's the man that God's put there. And until you pray him out, that's where he's going to be. And when it comes to Trump, tough. You're a Christian. You're called to pray for your leaders. You don't like Israel, tough. Pray for Jerusalem every single day. Whether you like it or not, it's a scriptural injunction. You have to do it. Prophesy. Yes. Brother, I like your prophecy. Thank you very much. Over Debbie. That was spot on. You, you and I, we can minister together, brother. Anywhere you want to go, I'll go with you. Yes, we do. <laughs> Prophets, prophetesses. Why can't you wake up in the morning and God speak in your ear, give you a word for this country? God gave me a word for this country before I came. Because I went to the Lord. He always gives me doom and gloom stuff. And I like to be happy. Don't you like to be happy? <laughs> I say, Lord, why are you giving me doom and gloom? He said, but you haven't asked for the solution. Ah, okay, the solution, okay. So what happened was the first time I came, I came, I've been 14 times to Charlotte, by the way. This is my 14th trip. I wake up one morning, the Lord says, tell America they're under judgment. So I go and I look under Jeremiah, 14 judgments, three judgments. And the first judgment is violence in the street. And the week I arrived, they come here in Charlotte and they riot and rant and rave and break down things and burn things. I said, there's your violence. The next thing is pestilences. Oh, no, Lyme disease. It even hit me. I even got it. It was spreading all over. And they're telling me it's coming from Canada. I don't know how that works. But I, I don't know the difference. I said, okay, that's fine. And then nature of I got to when Katrina hit. I'm going, man, nature's revolting against me. Look at this. And it was so strange because I was in the room praying and saying, Lord, what do I do? I can't go home. Katrina's here. He said, change your ticket to Tuesday. I said, okay, crazy. This is crazy stuff. I found the lady. She said, can I change the ticket to Tuesday? Oh, I don't think you'll get out because of Katrina. I said, change the ticket to Tuesday, please, lady. That's all I'm asking you to do. I pay the $400 for the change. The only day you can fly out is Tuesday. I get back home going, hallelujah. Katrina didn't follow me. Glory be to the Lord. Why is it judgment? For three reasons. Simple reasons. Abortion is number one. Yes. 
Somebody asked me this morning about abortion. How would you uh, speak to someone who advocates abortion? I would say to him, you know what, I'm going to pray that God sends you to hell. <laughs> Why? Because I want you to go to hell for a week. And I want you, when you're in your little cage in hell, hear the torment that you're going to go through. 61 million babies are going to scream at you every single day saying, why did you kill me? You ever thought about the torment that the women and the doctors who advocate abortion are going to go through? And you're not going to hear it for a week and then you can go to Hawaii for a week's holiday. You're going to hear it every single day for the rest of eternity. What a torment. What a terrible torment. Kill babies. What do you think you hear it? Well, Pharaoh, you don't have the right to do that. I don't care whose life is at stake. You don't have the right to do it. That child has a right to live. We need prophets. I don't understand why the church doesn't stand up and say, whoa, 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 stop. This whole thing about sex education, this thing with little men who think they're women teaching to kids in libraries. Where's the churches? Why don't they stand up and say, whoa, 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 whoa. We're pulling our kids out of the schools till you change your attitude. Who's got the power? We the people. Isn't that your constitution? Listen, I'm a South African. I don't have that ability. You do. We the people. It's time for you to rise up as prophetesses and start to speak into these evils. Because we're going the way of the world before Noah. And you know what happened to Noah? He went through judgment. And if America thinks they're going to escape judgment, well, you're fooling yourself. South Africa's going through it right now. That's why I want to get out of it, because it's a place of violence. Everybody's killing each other. We've had six and a half thousand farmers die in ten years. Farmers. Six and a half thousand have been slaughtered on their farms. If we had to turn that around and start to slaughter ANC political guys, do you know there'd be an outcry throughout the world and there'll be racialism. You're killing all the black guys. But when you kill the farmers, nobody says anything. In fact, our president lied to Donald Trump and said to him, there are no killings going on in South Africa. You've been misinformed. Yes. I mean, I don't know what, what he was smoking the night before, but it wasn't good for him the next day. Where are the prophetesses saying, thus saith the Lord? No more. Abortion. The thing about Jerusalem, that's the only thing I see there's been a change. Because when I first came here, Obama's group was so anti-Israel, it was pathetic. It was really sad. And here's the, here's the story. If you bless my people, Israel, I will bless you. If you do not bless them, I will curse you. Oh, well, America is under a curse. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump changed that. Thank God for Donald Trump putting it right that embassy in Jerusalem. He did a brave thing. The whole world was against him. Now they're all starting to move their embassies to Jerusalem. Israel. And the last thing is about the sexual stuff that's going on in your court. Transgender. I go, man, I had somebody who says, oh, I was born transgender. I think, you know what? I wonder when God changed his mind. I wonder what day God woke up and says, you know what? I'm tired of man and female. Let's make a, somebody in the in-betweens. My, my Bible tells me my God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, the Holy Spirit has left the earth, like some preachers teach. We no longer do those things because the perfect's come. What perfect? Where's the perfect? Haven't lost, last place I see perfect is in the churches. <coughs> Oh, don't worry, man and female, don't worry. Forget about that, don't worry. You can now have in between. Man, female, other, go other. Next time they put one of those things under my face, I'm going to tick all the boxes. <laughs> Just to confuse them. <laughs> and I want to say this. That's the reasons why America's under judgment. I go to the Lord and I say, oh, that's a nice message. They're going to kill me when I go to America with this message. And I came and I gave the message. And then I get on TV and I'm in a magazine. I'm giving this message and I'm thinking, man, I'll tell you what, they're going to come hang me. And this time I said, Lord, please don't send me back with these harsh messages. Give me something nice. He said, I'll give you three solutions. Solution one, home churches, sister. Home churches. If you're in a big church, don't tell your pastor, split us up and make us home churches. <laughs> 
And if he doesn't want to go to a church where you can be involved in a home church. I have a home church. I'm a pastor of a home church. I resigned from a big church, became a pastor of a home church because I wanted the support. Because even as a pastor in a big church, I had no support. And when I cried to God about it, he said, go resign. Christmas Eve 2005, I resigned. Hardest thing I ever did. But I realized one thing. I need the familiarity of people around me who meet just with me and my family once a week. I have 12 people in my home church and I don't want another soul. I don't want it too big. I want it small. I know all the guys in my home church. We've been walking together for five or six years. Then when I go on healing crusades, they come with me and they do the ministry. All I do is preach. They do all the praying. I have a British lady. Her name is Claire. She's got this wonderful accent. You know how the British speak, especially the high British. You walk up to her and she says, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And the people go, no. She says, do you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? They say, we'd love to. And she puts her hands on there and they will start speaking in tongues. I think, Lord, I've got to battle to get people to speak in tongues. Claire does it with one touch of her hand. That's unfair. <laughs> That's not right, Lord. But God's raised her up for that. That's her ministry. And I let her go. Go for it. Go for it. I say, Claire, please. Absolutely. Hallelujah. Home churches. The second thing is spiritual warfare. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you have to get into spiritual warfare if you wish to survive. If you do not, you, if you, do not you are going to die young and you're not going to make your full years. There is too much demonic activity. I drove the other day out of Charlotte into South Carolina. I was with Tony. Tony, I was with you, wasn't I? Yeah. I said, the moment we're in South Carolina, I don't know where I am. I said, it's lifted. It's gone. Where's that darkness? There is a demonic oppression over Charlotte. I thought, man, and the, the reason being is because people are not doing spiritual warfare against the demonic. They might be praying for everything else except taking on that demon that rules over the city. Spiritual warfare. Take it on. Be brave. Be a soldier. And this is what you need to do. You need to wake up in the morning and put on your crown of salvation. Right. Put it on. Every morning. Otherwise your mind goes crazy in the day. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. I do it every morning. The same thing I'm doing with you now. I would girdle my loins with truth. I touch my feet to say, this, this feet's going to preach the gospel. This one too. I pick up my shield. And the word the Lord gives me, I use as a sword and as a war cry that day. And watch out. Anybody in my way, you're going to get a war cry. I'll shout at you. I'm not scared to shout. And I'll shout at the devil. I'm not scared to shout at the devil. Somebody's got to take authority over him. And if he's playing havoc with your health, and he's playing havoc with your finances, he's playing havoc with your family, time for you to stand up and fight him back. Yes. Don't be a coward. You have the presence of God. You have the one who's greater in you than he that is in the world. Yes. Fight like crazy or lose. It's your choice. The power of life and death is in your tongue. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. So those are the three solutions. Spiritual warfare. Hallelujah, home churches. And I haven't given you the third one yet. Because no. the third one is going to shock you. Get into the prophetic ministry. <laughs> People are so scared of the prophetic ministry. But let me tell you something. If you're not in it, and you're driving down the road, and the Holy Spirit says go left when you want to go right, and you miss the point. You'll go right, have an accident, you'll be dead the next day. You have to learn to listen to the Holy right. Ghost. Amen. Because He will save you from the thing that's lying ahead of you that wants to destroy you. You've got to get into it. You've got to, when you see people, your discernment of spirit, you've got to have it because I have these people that come into my house for counsel. In fact, I've banned all counsel in my house. I'll go to the restaurant. I'll rather the demons can sit by the restaurant. Because <laughs> they come into my house. My wife and I don't fight. We have an agreement. We don't fight. We love each other. If she makes me mad, I'll go for a walk. She follows me in the car and says, okay, it's all over now. Jump in the car. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> People come into my house. 
and the moment they leave, she and I are fighting each other. We know what it is. I say, Ursula, there's that spirit. He's come in the house again. Now they're going to go anoint the doors and the walls all over again, the windows all over again, because somebody's brought their demons with them. I've got a pastor. He always says, Pastor, I want to come for counsel. He gets to my gate, turn around and rides away. My wife says, why doesn't he want to come in? I said, because his demons don't want to come into the presence of God in this house. And those that do escape, they leave them behind. I don't want them in my house. Go, 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 out. So I have this dream. I say, Lord, I'm a good old Assemblies God boy. I don't understand all this stuff. When I first got into the prophetic, it was introduction, three points, conclusion. Let's go home. I mean, really, that was really, we were really operating in the spirit in those days. <laughs> I'm lying in this bed and my wife is overseas in Ireland and suddenly there's this creature, I'm having a dream, this creature falls on my, on my chest but it looks like a gigantic cockroach. And it's doing this at me with its little things that stick out its mouth. But the smell of my sister was terrible. And I'm going, ah, ah, ah. <coughs> And then I realize I'm having a dream. And I don't wake up, I'm still in the room, I jump up on my bed and I say, who do you think you are? You come into this house without my permission. This is my home. And great is he that is in me than you. Out in Jesus' name. And I gave him a kick like you can't believe. I was a soccer player, so I kicked him like I did when I was 18. <laughs> I kicked him. And he squealed and he ran. And I went after him. And I said, the blood of Jesus is against you. I put a fire of God around this house. I set angels around this house. You won't come into this house again, ever again. Out. And he jumped through the window and he was gone. And I woke up and I was shivering and shaking because the adrenaline was running. And the Lord said this to me. Because I said, Lord, what was that all about? He said this. If you don't chase them out, they squat. They park if you don't chase them out. If they come into your house, you have to chase them out. Otherwise, they will destroy everything about you. They'll take away your finance. They'll bring ill health into your home. They'll cause division in your family because you never took care of that demonic entity in your house. So I want to tell you another story. I come from a long list of generals in the, what we call the Boer War, where the Afrikaans people of which I'm part of fought with the British between 1900 and 1903. And my great-grandfather was a guy called Ben Fulun. Now, my surname is not Fulun, it's Vainal, but that's another long story, but we won't have time for that tonight. <laughs> and I go to Pagosa Springs in Colorado. Pete, my host, takes me there. Two days drive. I hated the drive. Because when you go through Kansas, all you see are windmills and sunflowers. <laughs> I'm going, dear Lord Jesus, isn't there anything else to see? This is the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. And I'm two days stuck in the truck with this friend of mine, and I, I don't even know what to say to him anymore. <laughs> we get to Pagosa Springs. I say, Pete, do me one favor, please. Do not take me back to Charlotte through Kansas. Please, I beg you. He says, okay, come, we'll go through New Mexico. So we go through New Mexico. And we get to this little town in New Mexico. I can't even say the name, so I'm not going to say it. And he says, I'm going to get gas. And I step out the truck, and I'm going to now go into the shop at the gas station, get me a Diet Coke or a water or something. And as I put my foot on the ground, I hear the Lord say this to me. I have now fulfilled a promise I made to your great-grandfather. Wow. What? I jumped back in that truck, and I went white. Pete says, what's the matter? I said, I just heard the voice of the Lord. And I don't know what it means. Anyway, he takes me back and I'm just, I'm a basket case right through the whole trip coming because I don't know what it means. I go on the net and I find a book written by my great-grandfather and it's a story about his life, how he was in the war and how the British court him, sent him to a concentration camp and then when the war was over, they asked him to sign what they call the Roy Yet, which means the Red Oath, which means he must now submit to the Queen. He said, what? I'll never submit to her. She's British. I hate the British. In Afrikaans, we call them bitter enders. In other words, they're very bitter right to the end. So I'm thinking, hey, Grandpa, hey, cool, cool, eh? Because we don't really like the British. Cool, cool, Grandpa, I like you. you. You're cool. And I'm reading his mind and finding it very surreal. And then he tells the story that when he was in the concentration camp, the British came to him and said, okay, you can go back to South Africa on one condition. 
that you leave South Africa within three months and you go somewhere else. He says, okay, comes to South Africa, divorces his wife, who's got seven children. Of her, her eldest son was my great-grandfather. He comes where? To America. Where does he live? New Mexico. Mexico. Who's he married to? American lady. That same town where he lives was his farm. Now I'm seeing this, I'm going, wow, look at this. Then I got the shock of my life. The last chapter is how involved he was with the lodges and the masons. Mm. He was a 33 degree whatever. Yeah. I think, you know what, Grandpa, I thought you were such a good guy, but you were a fool. Right. You were an idiot. Yeah. Because you invited the enemy yes. into this family. That's right. Yeah. That's what you did. Yeah. You were stupid. Now I'm talking to him. Mean, he's dead. He can't hear me, but I'm talking to him in the <laughs> My wife and I had to go through a whole repentance thing about Masonic stuff, lodges, and all this, this witchcraft stuff that goes on with the Masonic mm -hmm. until we felt that spirit lift. Mm -hmm. And when it lifted, the Lord said to me, it's left your family now. Because yeah. you took a stand against it. Mm -hmm. Spiritual warfare, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so you prophetess. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Let's have a look, see what we've got. We've got a, this prophetess. Hallelujah. I, I like that story <laughs> about the prophet. He says, and some prophets and some evangelists. Well, I think that there are enough female evangelists out there. I think some of you are evangelists. I think Debbie is an evangelist. She goes in. She's like, a, like an apostolic evangelistic type of ministry. Goes in and pulls them out of the snare of the devil and gets them saved and healed and delivered and set free inwardly. I wonder how many of you are evangelists. Now you all look at Franklin Graham and you say, well, he's the evangelist. No, you are. Oh, but I'm a woman. That's got nothing to do with it. The Samaritan woman, my dear, after she spoke to Jesus, she ran into that town. And she said, come, meet the man who's told me everything about my life. I think, are you insane? He told you one line. That's not your whole life. But because of her word, the whole town gets saved. Yes. You want to tell me that isn't an evangelist? Of course that's an evangelist. So I wonder how many of you will go out into the streets, go door to door, give out tracts and invite people into your home church so that you can start a movement yourself. Nothing stopping you except your own prejudice and listening to men who are full of prejudice, who don't even read the scripture properly. Submit unto men as they submit unto the Lord. You know, I was at a church, at a Latino church, that I said, you know what, this is what you do. If your husband beats you, go to, Luke, go to Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Go before God and say, you said, believe in the Lord Jesus. Me and my whole household will be saved. Right. Am I right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it say that? Mm -hmm. So you've got a word. You can go before the Lord with a word. Then go to your husband, stick your finger under his nose. And say, hey, you. That's what the word says. Yeah. Believe in the Lord Jesus. You are going to get saved. You are going to come to church. And you are going to serve the Lord Jesus with me. And if he says he isn't, I say, well, bad luck you are because I'm a praying woman. I'm a praying wife and I'm going to pray you into the kingdom if you don't want to listen. You see, women must have some backbone in the old days. It was the women who did things. I had a grandmother. She was a Daniel prayer. You pray seven and eight in the morning, one and two in the afternoon, five and six in the evening. I get hungry. I'm a little boy and I run around in the farm, go knock on my granny's door one day. I only did it once because I learned. <laughs> Knock on the door. She opens the door, she comes out with a whip. She smacks me. I said, well, why'd you do that, Granny? She said, never disturb me when I'm with Jesus. And I'm looking past her. Who's this Jesus fellow in your bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> she would not allow me to disturb her. I could be dying. She wasn't interested. <laughs> She was praying to the Lord at that time. I'm here tonight because of her. That's right. She went to God and said, give me a seed that will take the word into all the world. I'm that seed. Right. I didn't want to do this. I wanted a boat, a blonde. I wanted books. I wanted brandy. 
And now I'm in Charlotte preaching to you. What happened? <laughs> My grandmother got me here. How many of your family will get into the kingdom and do great things in the kingdom because of you? Yeah. Hallelujah. You've got to make a stand. If you don't make a stand, they're all going to die. Or they're all going to go into drugs or prostitution. Then there's no one else to blame but you, I'm afraid. Come on, ladies. We're going to fight back. We're going to take back that which belongs to us. The blessings of God are ours. They don't belong to the devil. They belong to us. And one of them is that me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I don't care what anybody says. We in my house, we have a, what they call Book of Fat. Book of Fat is a Sunday afternoon ritual in my family. Where we take the Bible. We're the only family in the world that we think that has read through the whole Bible three times. Chapter by chapter. So we start in Genesis 1. We go right through to Revelation. I think the first time it took us 10 years. Because we read three or four chapters in the Sunday. And then we all pray together as a family. And now while I'm here, they pray there. I'm praying here too. They told me Psalm 119 and go, oh no, not Psalm 119. Oh, come on, that's going to take me hours. And we have to read it out loud. I can't just read it. Uh, 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 book of fat, you read it out loud. What are you doing with your family? How are you getting your family together to pray together? You see, you're the evangelist in the family. Forget about the men. You are. You're the one that will lead the kids and the grandkids to the Lord and your neighbors to the Lord. Sure. And who knows, if you go down the street, you give out tracts, you'll have a home church just like this and you'll be preaching every Wednesday night to them. Amen. Evangelists. Amen. Pastors. Oh, come on, man. You've had some fantastic pastors that are women in America. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in Japan. I, this was a strange... 1979, I, we go to North, South Korea to see Yongi Chan, this big church. You know, the yeah. million people church. And John Yonggi Cha did the right thing. You know what he did, how he got his church to grow? Mm -hmm. He got all the women. Yep. He said, you're my pastors, evangelists and apostles, etc. What happened? The women went crazy. <laughs> and there was one lady, he said, I want you to go to Japan. Now you must understand, that was a hard thing for her to do. Because a Korean woman is considered a dog in Japan. She goes to Japan. She's hallelujahing for the Lord. And she sees all these apartment buildings. She goes up there and she got a little track. If you want to be healed, come and see me. Before long, she got a whole lot of people. It's a lot of healing start to happen in Jesus' name. We go there because we're not allowed in South Korea. Yonggi Cha comes to us and he says to us, he's with us five days in the hotel. He says, come. I'll take you to see this lady pastor. Now, in Japan, the average size church is 40 people. If you have a church of 40 people, you're considered successful. She had 1,500 people, Lisa. 1,500 people. She was a strange lady. She was the pastor. And she walked around with these four young Japanese men walking around and speaking in tongues. I said, what's that? She said, no, they're my bodyguards. They're praying for me all the time. I said, I want to hear what they have to say. She said, don't talk to them. They pray. They pray. Don't you dare talk to them. When I tell them to stop praying, you can talk to them. I go, whoa, this is a pastor with a bit of fire in her. Now, why can't we do that? Why can't some of you ladies become pastors of churches? Why? Because men intimidate Oh, please, man. My wife says men don't intimidate me. And I always say, why? She says, because I have a frying pan in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> she says, you get up to mischief, you're going to feel the back of the frying pan right on the back of your head. Okay, okay, okay. I lose. All right. I submit. There's no reason for you to be afraid of a man. And just because some man has a prejudice against women, that's his issue. That's his problem. Give him a tissue and handkerchief and say, go cry in the corner. Grow up and be a man. This is the 21st century. This is not when women were stupid, ignorant, unlearned, uneducated. This is the time when women have come into them. In fact, the Bible says in the last days, women will surpass men. You ever read that scripture? No? Huh? Am I right, sister? Yes, so don't be intimidated by men. If God calls you to be a pastor, be a pastor. If you're afraid or you want some support, get some men around you and use them as your counselors. Because in the mind of many counselors, there's much wisdom. That's right. yes. yeah, uh, Catherine Kuhlman always said that. She said this, 
She said two things. She said, number one, God wanted to give this ministry to a man. He didn't want it. Number two, God told me, I must have men around me just to give me wisdom at times when I don't know what to do. That's what you do. You're away. You're a pastor. Nothing wrong. There's a good pastor right here in Concord. Donna Wise. I think she's a great pastor. The only reason why you can't be a pastor either. Part of the fivefold ministry. Am I right? Okay, so let's get to the last one. Teacher. Everybody flops around with teacher. Woo, you mustn't teach. Go tell Joyce Mayer that. That's right. Go tell Joyce you're not allowed to preach. She'll give you an earful. Because she knows that God called her to teach. Am, am I right? And you know what? I'm in Africa. You're in America. She's from America. Do you know what effect she's had in Africa? Because of her teaching. So you can't come and tell me women can't teach? What are you talking about, man? If you don't want to listen to a woman, go somewhere where it's a men's only club. <laughs> listen, I live with four women. I get prophecies and teachings. All My wife wakes me up and says, Oh, I just got this from the Lord. I go, Lord, how come you're always talking to her and you're not talking to me? What's going on here? She said, let me teach you something. So she phones me the other morning. I want to teach you something, Andre. I said, what? She said, two things. I said, what? If. I said, so what about if? She said, have you looked at the word? It's a little I and a big F. I said, yeah. She said, the F is bigger than the I, isn't it? I said, yeah. She said, I means you and F means the fiend, which means the devil. Mm. Now, when you come to somebody and they say, if it be the will of God, that tells me they don't know what the will of God is. Mm. She said, if is the doorway to doubt. The more you use if, the more you're going to doubt. You know, I want to be healed if it's God's will. Well, then you don't know what the Bible says because the Bible says you must learn the word so that you know what his will is. Yes. Right. Yes, right. Am I right? Yes. Sure. So I say, Ursula, that's a revelation. She says, thank you. Can I give you my second one? I say, Ursula, sure. Give me the second one. She says, never stand on the word of God. I say, what are you talking about? I'm Pentecostal. All I've been teaching is stand on the word. She said, don't stand. She said, when Philip was walking, or when Peter was walking on the water, what did he do? He stood still. And what happened? He started to sink. So long as he's walking on the water, he never sank. Yeah. He said, what we do is we take one scripture, Mr. MacArthur, please listen to me, one scripture, and we base our whole life around one scripture when the Bible calls us to walk in the spirit. This going through the Bible is not standing still. It's walking. If you want to know about your family, walk from Genesis to Revelation. Don't get one little scripture and stick it up everybody's nose. Get a whole bunch of scriptures so you get the whole story. Let's talk about women in the Bible. How about Eve? None of us would be here without Eve. The one I love is Sarah. Do you know how Abraham kept his faith? Because he had Sarah. Every time Sarah woke up in the morning, she said, Abraham, father of many nations. And every time she said, Sarah, mother of many nations. What did that do? It built up their faith. <laughs> Abraham wouldn't have had faith without Sarah. Everybody ignores Sarah. But man, she was the one that was encouraging him all the time. How about Rahab or, or Rachel? What about Rachel? What about Elizabeth. Oh, man, when she saw Mary come through that door, she was busy prophesying, going crazy. That's right. What about Mary? You and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a Mary. Thank God for Mary. That's right. So we talk about women in the Bible. We talk about the things that women do. And what have I done? All I've done is gone from Genesis to Revelation and looked at what every woman has done. How about Deborah? Man, she was the trump of the day. She was the president of Israel, the prime minister of Israel. She ruled Israel with an iron rod. Her name was Deborah. And let me tell you, she wore a frock and not jeans. She was a lady. Mm. Oh, it's convenient to forget about all those people. You can't. Women are an integral part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God cannot grow without women. So let me make a prediction here. And let me tell you my own sad story. Tonight is a pivotal night for women in Charlotte. 
It's the 11th of the 11th, 2019. Double blessing, 11 is two ones, double blessing. 11 is two ones, double blessing. 2019 works out to 30 or 12, depending on how you add it up, which means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three. Now I'll tell you what's happening in Charlotte. I've been here 16, 14 times. There was a year when one gentleman took me around the whole town and he said, I want to show you the places of revival. He took me to a graveyard next to a Presbyterian church. I'm going, how do these guys equate this stuff? His dead burial grounds. There's tombs here. But this was the place of revival. And I'm sure it happened in revival before the tombs were there. The only thing you'll find there is not the Holy Ghost, but ghosts. Okay, where do the guys get this? Then there's the other guy who says, well, we must go back to Azusa Street. I go, oh, please, man. Don't do that to me. I don't want to go to that wooden shack, Azusa Street. I don't want to have an Azusa Street. I want new wine and new wine skins. I don't want the old stuff, man. Please, stop it. Quit. So the gentleman phones me and he says, Andre, he says, praise the Lord. He says, they've asked you to preach at the Billy Graham Library. Now, I want to tell you something. For a little guy from Hermanus like me, that's a hang of a big honor. I mean, that's like, no South Africans preach at the Billy Graham Library. Not up to that day. I would have been the first. Hallelujah, brother. He tells me on the Monday, my wife's with me. I say to Usha, lock me up in a cupboard. I've got to get a word for Charlotte. God gives me an incredible word. Unbelievable word. I even always go, whoa, Holy Spirit, you sure, whoa. Friday, they phoned me and said, sorry, Andre, you're off the table. You can't preach tomorrow. I said, why not? No, the brothers, the pastors have decided that they haven't, they haven't vetted you. I said, what are you talking about, vetted me? I'm not a dog or a cat or a cow or a lamb or a sheep. Why must I be vetted? If you take something to the vet, he vets you. Why must I be vetted? No, they don't know you. I said, well, why didn't they bother to phone me and say, come and have lunch with us? Unfriendly bunch. In my country, that would never have happened. We would have invited the American to come and have lunch with us so we could get to know him. No, they didn't bother. I'm a heartbroken Lisa. And I'm bitter and twisted. And I'm angry. Because I think five days of wa waiting on God, and seriously, I locked myself in the room, and here I am, I come with this nonsense. So at any rate, my wife says to me, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I don't want to go near these guys. <laughs> because the Lord had given me a scripture, and the list scripture was simple. Mm -hmm. Was the Ethiopian man pulled Jeremiah out of the pit. Mm -hmm. And when Jeremiah was in the pit, and he was half drowning himself to death, here comes the Ethiopian man, pulls him out of the pit. But when I see that scripture, prophetically, I hear the Lord say, I've sent a man from Africa to stir up the gifts of the Spirit. Because Jeremiah represents the gifts of the Spirit. I say, cool. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm miffed, boy. I'm so angry. I'm so bitter. And my wife says, don't let you get bitter. That root will grow in you. And you'll become a bitter old. Don't do that. Go to the meeting. I said, I'm not going to the meeting. Go to the meeting. I'm not going to the meeting. Go to the meeting. And I'm seeing this pan come. Okay, I'm going to the meeting. <laughs> Sheila, you were there. Yep. So anyway, I'm sitting there and I'm, I, I'm really, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm so angry because I feel, I feel it was my opportunity to become well known in Charlotte at any rate, to give me more opportunity to minister. Because that's all I want to do. I just want to share the word. A black guy gets up and he stands and goes up to the table and he starts to sing the song, Nothing But the Blood, the Blood of Jesus. And I'm sitting there and I start to cry and I say, Lord, cleanse me with that precious blood. And I feel the cleansing power of the blood do this to me. And it's gone. Now I go up to the pastors, hello, I'm Pastor Andre from South Africa. I'm the one you didn't better. <laughs> My wife says I'm a troublemaker. It's okay. <laughs> so I have to leave at one o'clock because we were going to Virginia. Ellen was taking me to Virginia. So at any rate, so I go out the Billy Graham Library and a lady who I'd ministered to before, she was a Latino lady. I didn't know her from soap. I went to her home church. I prayed for her. She fell down under the power. I prophesied over her. And that was the last I saw of her. I didn't even know what her name was. She comes running up to me and she throws her arms around me. 
It's a bit embarrassing because you're a very good looking lady. My wife's standing next to me. She's got her arms around me. I'm thinking, oh, here comes a pan. Here comes a pan. <laughs> and she whispers in the ear, this ear, she says to me, Pastor, God gave you the words of the Holy Spirit, but they do not want to hear what he has to say. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I burst into tears again. Oh, yeah. But she comforted me. Mm-hmm. I will forever be grateful to her for doing that. She didn't even, I didn't know she was there. She saw me move out. She came and she she was being so prophetic. You see, what I'm saying to you is this. We need to be comforted. We need revival to come. If the woman will not bring revival into Charlotte, Charlotte's lost. I know this is a hangover responsibility on you, but I'm going to be honest with you. The men don't want it. What the men want is to protect their little vineyards. Just in case someone from the outside comes and takes a few sheep away. And when you're losing sheep, what it equals is money. It's about mammon. Otherwise, they would open their doors like they do in South Africa and say, come and minister to us. Bring us a new word. They don't want to. They want to control. Now, God cannot move in a controlled society. He can't. It's impossible. Because it doesn't fit the norm. doesn't fit the dogma. doesn't fit what men have said. This is the way God must work. That's why they want Azusa Street. Why do they want Azusa Street? Why can't God do something totally different for a change? And I'm saying to you tonight, God is about to use the woman in this town. They're going to bring revival. Much to the men's chagrin, which means to their disgust. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage you ladies, I want to say this to you. Who cares what they say? Because you are one day going to stand before the King of Kings. And you are going to have to give an account of your calling that is placed on your life. Don't let Jesus down, please. As a brother, as a pastor, I plead with you. Do not let the Lord down. If a man want to do it, let them do it. But don't you dare do it. Have some backbone. Be strong in the Lord. Keep the faith. And if they give you a hard time, tell them, phone Pastor Andre. He knows about it. And I'll shout at them from South Africa. (laughs) God wants to use women. Because the men have not stood on the plate. They've gone missing. I heard tonight, commit suicide, pastor, commit suicide. What, what are you talking about? How can you as a pastor commit suicide? Are you mad? Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Nothing can get you down because you can do all things through Christ and strengthen you. What are you talking about? I'll tell you what it is. You won't fight the demons in your life. You won't take them on because you're too much of a coward. Take them on. Be strong. Be like Caleb and Joshua. Not like the other lot who said, Ooh, the giants. Ooh, we're scared of the giants. Be like Caleb and Joshua and say, no, no, listen. I don't care what they say. I am going to possess the land that God's put before me. I am going to do my ministry. I don't care what you say. I am going to go forward for Jesus. Because when people hear your voice and they get saved and they get healed and they get delivered and they get set free from demons, then they say, thank God that God sent that person into my life. I want to tell you the last story. Have I spoken a lot to you? Are you all sleeping in the back here? No. <laughs> I was a young pastor, started my first church, and they kicked me out because my hair was long and I wore a blue shirt, believe it or not. The pastor said to me, after I'd filled the church after three months, that when I went there, there were three old grannies and a blind grandpa. By the time the, the elders came from the denomination, the church was packed. In fact, they were sitting on the floor, some of the, the youngsters, and one guy even had a black dog. And I kept trying to think, how are we going to get this dog saved? He's got to get saved somehow, because he always comes to church. He was a very good Christian dog. <laughs> they called me aside, and they, after I preached a very simple message on Jesus is the good shepherd, they say, you fired. I say, how can you fire me? I filled your church. There are people in the church, the tithes are up. Everything is working. No, well, you see, brother, your hair is down to your shoulders. And it was. I was an ex 
and you're wearing a blue shirt. In our church, we only wear white shirts. I said, well, I tell you what. I said, stick your church up your backside. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm not going to submit myself to that legalism. I don't have to. I'm submitted to Jesus. Amen. I went across the road, started a church, took all the people that were all in my church across the road. And the others were back to three-year-old grannies and the blind grandpa. <laughs> and God taught me something. He said, I'm your father. I reserve the right to be your father. I'm your father and I'll teach you stuff. They don't want to accept you. Don't worry. The Spirit of God in you, the anointing in you will teach you all things. I said, Lord, I accept that. I don't like to be put aside from the other brothers in the denom, but let me tell you something. I'm not going to let them stop me ministering. I ain't going to let them stop me ministering. Because I have a passion for Jesus. And I have a compassion for people. I care about the people of God. I care about those that are not saved. I find myself crying at night that there are men and women that are involved in drugs and alcohol. This sex slave industry thing has torn me apart. I've laid before God and I've cried about it. And I think, what can I do? There must be something I can do apart from supporting Debbie's ministry. There's got to be something I can do. But I'm not skilled. I keep saying to Debbie, come and teach us what we can do. We're the churches. We're the so-called pastors. Cowards. We've got three, four, five hundred people behind them. Do something about it. How about the abortion thing? They all go missing. Why? How can you go to an abortion clinic and go and pray for the clinic? Are you insane? You lost the plot. You shouldn't even be in the ministry. You're making a mockery of the things of God. And that's what the men have done. I say, man, God, you can't use the men, use the ladies. They'll at least stand up for righteousness. They'll stand up for the things that are right. So I want to encourage you. So I have this lady, I go and I move into this lady's house, I go and stay in her flatland. She's an old lady. <laughs> she, one of those old Pentecostal brothers from the 1930s and 40s. <coughs> Another breed. Her name was Georgina Deneka. And I loved her because she was so harsh. It was amazing. She didn't believe in PC. You know what PC is? Political correctness. She didn't believe in that. She has these six Indian pastors. Durban has a large Indian population and a white and a black population. But all the Indian pastors used to go to Georgina once a week for ministry. And she was into the gifts. And I loved her because she was just, she just let it out. She wouldn't worry about what you thought. And we're sitting there one day and they're the pastors and their wives, and she turns to this one Indian pastor, he's a new guy's name was Bobby, and she says, Bobby, when will you stop sleeping with your secretary? <laughs> I have never seen a man cringe. <laughs> he went from Indian black to purple red, red skin red. <laughs> he got up and he ran, and his wife after him. Oh, yeah. I thought, Woo! Here it comes. What's going to happen now? And I was a new pastor. I mean, I, I'd never seen anything like that before. And you know, the, the general thing is, oh, you must love the people. Well, I mean, he really needed that bullet. They came back in there and they cried and he confessed. He said, I've been sleeping with my secretary. And she said, stop now or you'll lose your church. And he made right with his wife and he stopped and his church grew and grew and grew and he stopped sleeping with the secretary. Now, I always remember that about her. She was one of those ladies. She'd take a whip. She's like my grandmother, take a whip. That's why I maybe liked her so much. She comes to America. She says, uh, she said, first time I'm going to go to Harare. It was, it was called Sol uh, Salisbury, Rhodesia. Salisbury. The capital of Rhodesia, I'm going to go and preach in the street. She's in her 80s. She goes off on her own, puts on a sackcloth. <laughs> she had... A linen sewn in the inside so it wasn't too rough on her. She'd go in the streets of Salisbury giving out tracts, preaching to people. She's got a picture in the paper of South Africa. This mad old lady from the South Coast, I was living with her, the mad old lady. She comes back, she says, right, I'm ready now to go to America. I said, are oh, you nuts? She said, no, a lady from the State Department has invited me to go. I said, okay, go, I'll look after the house, go. She comes here. 
They take her into the White House. She goes, before Reagan, she goes and pleads the blood in every room, in the, every, every office in the White House, including the President's office. She's walking around casting out demons and I'm thinking, Jimmy Carter, your days are numbered. She comes back in Reagan 1. She says, you see, you see, you see? It's what we should be doing. Taking back that which God has given us. I go, wow. So she goes away again somewhere and then the black guy breaks in and he tries to steal her stuff, but he doesn't take anything. He leaves everything on the floor and they go to court and the, and the prosecutor says to her, did he steal anything? She says, no, he didn't. He left everything in a mess. I'd like to employ him to fix up the mess. Everything's all over the place. So the prosecutor said to the guy, why did you do that? He said, I was terrified. <laughs> he said, what were you terrified about? He said, I walked down the passage with the clothes under my arm. He said, no, this big white man came with wings, <laughs> shining like the sun. He said, I dropped that stuff and ran for my life. He said, I was terrified. Woman warriors. Woman warriors. She said, you can't steal from me. This house is covered in the blood. I'm preaching the gospel. Ladies, I want to tell you, please, I'm begging you. I don't care what these so-called very clever theologians say. I'm saying to you as a wild Pentecostal pastor. Please go and do your ministry and don't listen to the nonsense. Please. Go out there and do it. And you will find that the Spirit of God, ask Mary. Mary's a prime example. When I met Mary, Mary was, okay. Now she's wild. I don't know what's happened to Mary. You saw her just now. She's shivering and shaking and putting fire on everybody. But Mary knows that I've encouraged her. Mary's been on my online Bible school for a year, online Bible school. Mary knows that I pray for her every single day. She and Georgie, poor Gio, her husband. I pray for them. And I'm the first one to encourage Mary. Mary, come on, let's do some ministry. Come on, let's do some ministry. So I want to encourage you, ladies, please. Do some ministry. And don't worry about what the men are saying because God is going to bring revival through you. Can you agree with me? Yes. It says, if two agree concerning anything on earth, it's done by the Father in heaven. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to bring revival into this area, into Charlotte through the woman, Lord. Yes. You got your vessels. They're going to bring, Lord, the power of the Holy Ghost into this town. If the men can't do it, the women will. But this town we claim for Jesus. This is the town that you sent me to, to stir up the gifts of the Spirit, yes. to stir up the ministries. I'm doing exactly what you told me to do, Lord. And I'm asking you that you give Charlotte to the women, that they bring revival. You raise up churches where women are pastors. Yes, you start new ministries, apostolic ministries, where the women do it. You let the prophets not come from Kansas City, that's too far away, right here from Charlotte. Yes. Let the teachers come out of Charlotte. Let the evangelists, nationwide evangelists like Woodward Ezra, Father, please, in Jesus' name, release your spirit upon the women. That men and women might be saved, might be changed, might be healed, might be till hallelujah. There's the Lord is telling me, there's women here that need to get into the healing ministry. You need to get into healing. You need to lay hands upon the sick so that they would recover. It should be a standard thing you do in every meeting. You should be praying for the sick. And watch as God starts to do miracle after miracle after miracle. And men and women will flock to you for healing. Hallelujah. And raise women with compassion in their hearts and passion in their voices and in their preaching as pastors for your people that they might be taken care of and ministered to and loved.
I ask you to raise up women here this night that when they go and pray for people to get baptized in the Holy Ghost, they just lay their hands, yes. people start to speak in tongues. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Not a long thing, not an issue, not a shout, not a shout, just a yes. speak in tongues. Let the anointing come upon the folk in Jesus' name. Pray for the ladies right here in Charlotte, Lord. Everyone that has a ministry here, I ask you to explode it on them. Explode it on them. They don't know what to do with it. It's so big that they just don't know. And then give them the teams behind them to just put the stuff together, Lord, so that it works in Jesus' name. There are three blessings of Abraham that we're all entitled to. Number one, supernatural provision. When Isaac spoke over Jacob, he said, I'll give you the dew of heaven. Supernatural provision. There is no dew in heaven, sister. It's supernatural. I'll give you oil and corn and wine in your cupboard. There will always be provision for you. You step out in faith, God will provide. His finger points away, His hand will provide the means. Watch as God does incredible things for you. And the third thing is that all your brothers shall come and submit to you, Jacob. So all the people that you need to help you to do your ministry will come to your side. I prophesy now. I'm telling you right now that we need to find some ladies who will go and do event planning. And you girls need to go and start doing crusades all over the country. You need to go and start speaking out all over the country. Get some ladies to help you to set those events up. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. Find those ladies. Give me one. Let, let me go on your board and let me do that. I'll do it with you. Also need some places to go and minister to. You have something to say. Go and say it. Please. Please. And finally, take the Holy Spirit with you. Say, Lord, when I walk into that room, let the presence of God come down. Let people start to weep in the power of the Holy Ghost. Let them just start to, Lord, just fall on the floor and start to cry and bawl and squall and cry because they need to repent. Let the demons suddenly manifest so we can deal with them and get rid of them in Jesus' name. Hmm. There's some of you here that need to write books. Write your books. Write your books. Don't be afraid. Write them. Write them. Write them. And then use them. Go into the church and say, here's my book. I'm coming next Sunday to preach in your church. <laughs> Don't be intimidated. Go forward. Press on. God will give you favor. He will make the crooked places straight. That's what we, we prophesied over David. He will make the crooked places straight. He will break asunder the bars of iron. He will break open the cages of brass. And you shall walk in the favor of God. And the Spirit of God shall use you. And every time you declare something, it shall be established unto you, according to Job 20, 20 28, something like that. <coughs> Hallelujah. All right. So let me pray for you now. Hmm. There's some of you that have been very discouraged. No. Don't be discouraged. Press on. Press in. Press through. Go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm a bit discouraged, but we're going to try harder. And if Charlotte doesn't want you this week, then go somewhere else. Go down to Myrtle Beach. Lie on the beach for a couple of days and go preach down there. Don't be bound by Charlotte, because here's what the, Jesus said. He said to his disciples, we have to go to other towns and cities to preach the gospel. He never stood still. He was always moving. I told you in the beginning, don't stand on the word of God. Walk in the word of God. We walk in the spirit. You stand still, you sink. 
Go before the Lord if things don't work. Get into the Bible. Say, okay, now what am I doing wrong? Show me what I'm doing wrong and then I might correct it. Start Genesis and get right through to Revelation until he shows you what's going on. I always tell people, do this. Go away for three days. Take your Bible and your notepad. Go away for three days. You don't have to live in a tent. Don't be silly. Go live in a B&B, man. Gee whiz. I want to go live in a tent. Are you nuts? I won't do that. Hotels are fine with me. You can be alone in a hotel. Go for three days, because God always speaks on the third day. It's third day resurrection. Not two days, not one day, three days. On the third day, he'll speak to you and he'll tell you what to do. And I say that from experience. Then go out there and say, Lord Jesus, I'm here. I need some instruction, some wisdom. Come on, I'm here for three days. Speak to me through the word. I've got my, my book here and I write whatever I see in the word. Ju, 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 ju. After the third day, you'll get it. You'll say, wow, okay, Lord, I got it. Then you can come home. And he won't, he doesn't tarry longer than three days. He's got other people to see. When he's finished with you, he's going to go to my brother over there. Three days. So, Father, I pray for the ladies in this room, and I thank you so much. I'm going to pray for some of them, Lord, who want to be prayed for, but I want to tell you this, Lord Jesus. I want you to give them backbones that are so strong. Steel. In their backs. They've got steel in their backbones. They're so tough that even the men in this town are terrified of them. They're so full with the power of God, have such favor with the Lord, that the cowards run for their lives. Because the women of God have arrived and have come to turn this town upside down. Lord, so I ask you that you would anoint them with your power. Signs, wonders and miracles will follow when they speak the word. Like you said in the last verse of Mark. You will confirm the word with signs and wonders following. Let them be tough. Sometimes a bit rough, fine Lord. But make them tough. Make them strong in you. And finally, Lord, make them determined, no compromise, to declare you before man mankind. To declare the Holy Spirit before mankind. Let the Holy Spirit rise up within them and around them and on them in such a way that people walk into their presence can tangibly feel the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Give them revelation. They wake up in the morning and you're talking to them already. Let them wake up in the end of your bed. You're standing there ready to give them something new, something fresh. Not the old stuff, Lord. We need fresh meat. We need fresh bread every day. Not the old stuff. We don't want the old stuff. We want the new, the new wine and the new wine skins. Come on, Lord. Show them what to do. Show them what to preach that will deliver mankind, that will encourage mankind, that will edify mankind, that will comfort mankind. Not stuff that means nothing. That when people leave the church, they've forgotten what the preacher said. But stuff that makes a difference to their lives. If they walk out there and say, I'm different, something's different, something's happened to me, I'm changed, something's gone on inside me, I get it, I understand it that they bring deliverance. For he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And my people perish for a lack of knowledge, but we're not going to perish, Lord, because we're not going to allow the lack of knowledge to stop us. We're going to seek you out. We're going to seek your face, and we're going to see revival come to Charlotte, to North Carolina, and to the rest of America. And it all starts right here tonight, in Jesus' name. Quicken your people, Lord, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with his person, but most of all with the plans that he's laid before us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.